All right, here we are once again. This <clears throat> roof, the sun is getting low in the sky, and um, I'm just glad to be here. Are y'all glad to be here? All right. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me over to 2 Corinthians. I've got a little ring there, fellas. Thank you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to look at a few verses here tonight. And if you would, in honor and reverence, please stand with me this evening and let's read His Word. I really enjoyed the word this morning because a large percent of the reading was in red. I hope your Bible has it in red. That was Jesus speaking. However, tonight we have a, a letter to the Corinthians. And let's begin chapter 5 and verse number 10. Chapter 5 and verse number 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, they that which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself, by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray that you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we'll pause there tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, that we're able, able to come to this place tonight to hear your word, to sing the songs of praise to you. Father, I just pray tonight that you would have uh, something to, for us, that you would show us what you have. I know uh, your word is, is full of things. Uh, these few scriptures here tonight, there are many sermons that could come from just these few scriptures. And Father, we pray tonight for those who are sick around us, those who are under the weather, those who are uh, in a nursing facility those who are in the hospital this very moment, we lift them up to you because you are the great physician. And Father, we lean on you and we ask that thy will will be done, of course, but if it be thy will, make the corrections. Give us miracles and we praise you and we will praise you and we glorify your name tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of our message tonight, I, uh, I didn't struggle with it. Matter of fact, I, I, I didn't really bring it on through the message as you'll see tonight. But think about this, just a short, quick. God's book of world's records. 
Now, we know that God, when we ask Him to forgive us of our sins, He takes those sins and He throws them away. He remembers them no more. But what I'm talking about in the book of world records is this. That there is a book. He does keep records. And yes, how do we know? Because the Bible tells us so. And why does God keep these records? Well, He keeps them to show us because we're human and, and we forget. And as time goes on, I feel a forgetfulness coming over me. Um, we keep records so that we know what happened last month or the month before. I'm thinking of financial things, but it could be anything. So one day, this scripture tells us one day we're going to stand before God for the judgment. Now, we have to know this before we begin, but Paul is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the great white throne judgment where the uh, lost will go uh, and from there they'll go into the lake of fire. But this is the Bema seat. This is the judgment seat. And actually at that time, there was still a Bema seat in Corinth, in the city of Corinth. And that was the place where the judges would come. And if anyone had something against you, they would come and, and make their remarks. Maybe you would be put on trial there. But there was no question of life or death there. And there's no question of eternal life at the Bema seat or at the judgment seat of Christ. At that seat... Only believers will be there. Y'all with me? Only believers will be there. And uh, you're going to have to go there. And I'm going to have to go there. But Christ fully atoned for our sins on the cross. Amen. He's not judging us for our sins. But what is happening? The judgment is to see whether you're going to receive a reward or not. Amen. When Paul says we must all appear... Remember, he's writing to believers. And we, believers, being believers, will be there. Now, we'll be judged on the way we live the Christian life. Amen. And when we think about this, we're going to be judged on the way we have lived our earthly life, our Christian life. And Paul... Uh, says and talks about the question is, how did we use those bodies? In other words, inside of this old fleshly body is a, a soul. How did we use that old, old body? Paul faces that question when he writes to the, the Philippians. You may remember when he said, uh, Philippians 1 and 21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, and then he talks about his desire to go and, and be with Christ, but then also he says, on the other hand, I'd like to preach a little while longer. I'd like to do this and, and to do that and to minister to the Philippians. And he wanted to stay and he wanted to preach the gospel of Christ just a little bit longer. My wife and I were speaking this afternoon and, and we were talking about uh, wanting to go to heaven. Well, I'm wanting to go to heaven, but... She said, well, if you really want to go to heaven, how come you go to the doctor if you're sick, you know? That's true. We really want to go. But boy, we get to that doctor. Preacher asked one night, he said, how many of you want to go to heaven? And of course, everybody put up their hand except one little boy down here on the front row. And the pastor turned to him and he said, don't you want to go to heaven? And the boy said, sure, I want to go to heaven. But I thought you was getting up a load tonight. So we want to go to heaven, don't we? We know that the Lord has saved us and He has, has uh, come into our life and into our heart. And so we want to go, but at the same time, we don't want to go just right now. Not hardly yet. What are we going to do at that Bema seat? What are we going to do on that day? We're going to give Him a, a report. Now I know that God sees all. He hears all and He knows all. I don't believe it'll be a paper report like we scribbled out on some notepad, but it'll be a report. Let me make very clear, and I said this earlier, this is not the great white throne judgment over in Revelation 20. 
where only the unsaved will stand and meet their Creator. What a dismal day that will be for many people. But if you're a believer, if your name is written in the book, the book of life, and that means that you have salvation, you have eternal life, and you will stand before the Bema seat, before this place of judgment, to be judged for rewards. Now, let's pick up here at uh, verse 11, because it tells us something a little bit uh, different than normal. It says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. I think that word terror could also be translated fear, but there is a, a great deal said in the Bible about the fear of the Lord, about uh, being reverent and, and uh, honoring Him, uh, even in the way we, we live life. We are told that the fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom over in Proverbs. So when we realize exactly who He is and what a great God He is. You know, one of the ideas of, of liberalism, and I'm speaking of a, a Christian liberalism here, is they say, well, we don't need to fear God. They use statements like... Um, they characterize God as being so sweet and, and being loving. There's no need to be afraid of Him. Now, you know what the Word says, don't you, over in Hebrews 10 and 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I think as we've gone through time, even in my short lifetime, we have noticed a difference in the reverence people have for God and, and God's things. You know, when I was in grade school, I can pretty much remember that each and every one talked about how the Bible is true and uh, how you should not swear on the Bible unless you're in a court of law. How you should treat this Bible and, and make sure that it is protected. And that was even children that did not go to church. They, they actually knew that the Bible was really something. And as we come down through time, uh, people do not respect God's holy word as they should. And I don't want to preach a, a, a watered down message or a, a sunshiny gospel message. Oh, everything's just fine. Let's just go on. No, our God is a, a holy God. He's a righteous God. And it is this, this holy God that loves us. He wants to make sure that you're saved. But if you don't receive Christ God's way, if you do not receive Him in that way, you have to come before Him in this other judgment that I spoke of a moment ago, the great white throne judgment. Look again at that verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men... In other words, Paul is saying God is a wrathful God and, and we want to persuade you to follow Him. Amen. And you know there's many a pulpit today that had no message like that. There's many a pulpit today across this nation where the, the sermons on, on punishment and, and very few sermons on judgment, not many sermons these days on hell and the fact that it is real. And so as a result to people listening, God's judgment is almost a, a lost thing today. We need to fear the judgment of God. Amen. We need to fear Him in a reverent way. And we need to recognize that we, we you and I, are going to be held accountable for being His followers, for doing what He asks. Verse 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. In other words, we're not trying to win a popularity contest. Amen. But pastors, ministers, evangelists, 
They are here because they, they want to preach the truth. And the truth should come from their messages and from God's messages. Now, I know sometimes that it's not easy to put together messages. But we hear messages of today that have nothing to do with the Bible. Have nothing to do with God or, or Christ. They want to tell you what you can do. How it's, uh, the power is within. And how you have the power to climb up and to, to get above wherever you are. There's so much today that goes on about uh, psychology and about the mind. How to become well adjusted. And uh, how to make it through life. But I want to say this, you cannot make it through life without Christ. I don't understand how people think that they can. But there's so much today that goes along with, with the preaching of self-help. And the preaching of power from within. Now it may not be popular for me to say this tonight. But it's the Word of God. And uh, I don't commend myself or put any kind of, of glory on myself. I give all the glory to God I, I try, uh, if you say something about the message, I just say, praise the Lord. Has nothing to do with me. We don't commend ourselves. We don't want you to glory in us, in, the, in pastors and ministers. We glory in Christ. Amen. And so the important thing for us to do is to declare, uh, as I've preached before, the whole counsel of God. Everything that He has for us is actually for us to preach. You know, uh, we need to step out of our own motivation and let the Lord get a hold of us. <laughs> we need to let the Holy Spirit get a hold of us instead of trying uh, with our own power. You know, that one thing right there where our motivation to, to get out the, the Word of God, to spread it around and to get people to recognize that God is still a judging God. He's still a wrathful God. Boy, that would wake some folks up, wouldn't it? Arouse some sleepy church folks. But missionaries are known. And I know that you've had missionaries to come and to, to let you know what was going on on the field. Missionaries letting you know uh, what they needed. They'd stop by and, and give us a couple of hours. Maybe they would bring a film or, or pictures. Early days, I say my early days, I can remember a man coming from Africa. He actually brought an umbrella stand made out of an elephant foot. The skin, the, the toenails and everything uh, of a real elephant. And I, I think it was already illegal by, back then, but he was able to, to bring it and to show it. It may have been much older when the law came down about... Uh, killing elephants. And as they come and as we learn about spreading God's word in other countries, I think now, and it's been said, that America is one of the, the greatest land that needs missionaries. Amen. We have people that are running around in this world that do not know Christ and they need to hear it. The United States, one of the greatest mission fields today. Amen. People in our land are, are in such need. And, and sometimes I think they don't even know how to communicate it back to anyone, what their needs are. And a lot of times, and I've said this before, they don't know they need the Lord. Somebody needs to go and, and tell these young men and women that they really need the Lord. And maybe you work with one of them. Maybe you stop at a stop sign or a, a light and, and they pass on by people that don't realize they need the Lord. Look at verse 13. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. Paul says that the, the people may think he's crazy. Now the reason I'm grinning and, and thinking about that is that uh, back in my... Uh, younger days uh, <clears throat> when I would talk about the Bible. This was before I was called to preach. I think I was teaching Sunday school or something like that. And, and I'd make the statement, well, people's going to think I'm crazy. 
You know what? Paul said it right there. Whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. We preach for the lost because they need to hear it. Paul says that, that uh, something else here. Look at verse 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. You see that two words there, constraineth us. It's a phrase there that's been misunderstood. I've misunderstood it in the past. The thought has been that the, the love of Christ restricts us or straps us down, or holds us back. And that's not right. It's not a holding back of constraining. That's not the meaning of that word in this place right here. Paul is using it here. He says, it's the love of Christ that is pushing us. It's the love of Christ that gets us out of our safety zone. It's the love of Christ that uh, we step out and, and begin something in Him. It's the love of Christ that motivates us. As I said, it's not our motivation. It's the love of, of Christ that causes us to, to hand out the Word of God, whether it be verbally, whether it be physically. And that's what sent Paul to the ends of the earth, was that push. So it's not a constraining holding us back, but it is a push. The old uh, creation... You think of when God created the heavens and the earth. The old creation was on trial in Adam. You remember the story. We look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, right there very early in Genesis. 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And you know the story, how Eve thought it looked good, but Adam was right there. Adam deliberately disobeyed God. Amen. He deliberately disobeyed God. He came under the sentence of death that very moment. Not only did he come under the sentence of death, but it travels all through the generations. That same sentence is to us because we're born lost, folks. The entire human race, all the way down, uh, is represented from his disobeying God. Now, think about this. You and I have been physically born but we're born into a family of death. If we don't come to the place where we realize that we're lost and we ask the Lord to save us and forgive us, if we never come to that point in life, we're still in the family of death. And I'm talking about spiritual death also. Not just our bodies, because what is being spiritually dead uh, when you talk about eternity? Hell, that is the answer. So Adam had everything that was good for him, but there was one thing that God told him not to do. And sure enough, he did it. Reminded me when I was a teenager, Brother Dave, the one thing my daddy told me, it was snow on the ground. Snow on the ground. Little David Moody got his license. What's he want to do? He wants to go right around town. But it's the first part of January, somewhere in there, and there's snow on the ground. And my dad said, well, it's not that bad. Just stay right here in town. Don't go out of town. What's the first thing I do? I pick up my buddies and, and we're in that Chevelle. Boy, it's got gears up here on the column. Woo, boy, I like that. And uh, I get out there. I've told this story before. I get out there and it's slick. And that old car just starts sliding off in the ditch just like that. My daddy said, don't get out of town. Well, what's the first thing I did? I get out of town. This farmer come by, I had to haul hay for him at one time, and he was shaking his head, and he goes, your daddy's going to whoop you when you get home. And another thing he said, don't, don't ever do this. He said, I'm going to have to pull you down in that ditch in order to get you out. I'm like, what? Peeled the chrome right off the side of that car. But anyway, 
Just like old Adam, the one thing that God told him not to do, he did it. About like a teenager. God had asked him not to do that. And that was the very thing that Adam did. And we call it, we use the word fail. Adam fell. We call it the fall of Adam. He came tumbling down out of paradise. Can you imagine living in a place where maybe you you tend a few things and make sure something's growing, but he didn't have to work for it. God supplied his food. God supplied his wife. God supplied everything he had. But after he had fallen, after he had fallen, you know, we don't think about it, but after he had fallen, he had a rough way to go, didn't he? By the sweat of the brow, he dug and he he churned that old ground. But the Lord Jesus came and gave us the right the opposite of Adam. You see, Adam was was the one who fell. Adam was the one uh, who uh, sinned against God. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world and He's totally opposite from Adam. He is absolutely sinless. Jesus is, and He was. He was holy. He was harmless. He was undefiled. He was separate from all sinners because He is not a sinner and He never did. But He came here to what? He came here to seek and to save those who are lost. That's what my Jesus did. God sent Him here for that. And when he saved someone, did he put them back in the Garden of Eden? No. He put them out in the regular world to live a different life than what the world is living. And he came down. Jesus did. He came down and he died in our place. He died for all, the Bible says. Not just some of us. Now, that brings us To when we believe, Ephesians says, Ephesians 2 and verse 6 says this, that we're now seated in the heavenlies and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now when the Bible talks about that, you and I were stuck in a time. We, we look at a clock, we've got to have a clock, I've got to know what time I do this and what time this and that. I'm talking about no clock here, folks. When Ephesians says, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. One came and died for all. Then we're all dead. You see, He took our place. We're now dead to sin. Um, He takes... He doesn't, as I said, He doesn't take people and place them back back in the garden. He puts them in the heavenlies. Now, let's look at verse 15. We've already had it, but let's touch on it again. And that He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto Him which died for them and rose again. What a description of the Lord saving us and us not living for ourselves. Us not living like the world, but we're living for Him. Now, our lives since salvation, they should show a devotion. We should live devoted to Him. And we should live, as I said, separate from the world. Just to what? Just to glorify God. That's the reason you were born, friend, is to glorify God. I think sometimes we forget that. And we say, well, I've I got to do this, I've got to do that. No, we're here to wake up in the morning and glorify God. Amen. We're going a little further here tonight. Verse 16. Wherefore henceforth now we know man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Paul was saying, yes, He used to walk on this earth. We used to know Him. We used to eat with Him. Paul maybe did not, but what I'm saying is that word after the flesh. We see people through different eyes when we look at them physically out in the world, and when we use that word 
world, there are lost men and lost women and lost children. I was thinking just yesterday that I worked with a fellow for about 14 years. And it didn't matter what I said. He was lost and he stayed lost. I don't know why I couldn't get through to him. And more than likely, he's still lost today. And he's lost because he's not in Christ. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. You see that? Now that's to say that we don't evaluate men according to their uh, racial background or according to their billfold or according to the family they grew up in or the color of their skin. We don't evaluate people that way. We know that according to the old nature, they're lost and they're in sin. But Christ died for all of them too. Christ died for all. He died for the, the richest uh, Bill Gates person. He, he died for the, the one who's lowly and on the street. He died for the fellow that, that has a house and he died for the fellow that doesn't. And he died for all. And James writes about this in his second chapter. He says it's wrong to give the honored place to a rich man and, and let the, the poor man stand in the corner. Speaking of a church service or a temple service, now why is that wrong, folks? Why is that wrong? Why would we pick out a certain place for the rich fella? Well, evidently, James knew that was going on and he spoke of it in his, in his book. Because as children of God, we are to look upon the whole human family as God's children. Even though they're, they're not saved yet, look upon them as, as sinners that Christ died for. Jesus walked on this earth over 2,000 years ago. And I, I think as we place Him there in certain places or doing certain things. He was born in Bethlehem, as we know. He walked in Nazareth. He walked in Galilee. He began His ministry there in Galilee. He went to Jerusalem. He died on the cross there in Jerusalem. He arose and then ascended to the Father. There's no man of Galilee today named Jesus. He no longer lives there or walks there or breathes there. Our Jesus, our Savior, is at the right hand of the Father. Amen. And so, you know, at Christmas time, many people, they, they make that trek over there to Bethlehem. You'll see it on the news. Oh, they had a great, um, what would I say, celebration. Sometimes you'll see them all gathered and going down the street. Now, I would enjoy doing that, but we need to know this. He's not there anymore. He's not a baby anymore. A lot of people want to look for Him. A lot of people, we talked on Wednesday night, a lot of people want to make sure and, and their little crucifix, make sure it has Jesus on it, you see. I don't know why they keep putting Him back on the cross. He died on that cross and He went and He was buried in the ground never to be on the cross again. Amen, Jerusalem is crowded with tourists at Easter time. But our risen Lord is not there. He's gone on. He's moved on. So we're not really identified with the, the physical person Jesus because it was so long ago. But we can identify with the spiritual Jesus, with the Son of God. We can identify with Him and listen to Him as, as we're in uh, times of, of worship and, and times of prayer. Now let's look at this 17th verse and we'll move on. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That one verse there, that one verse could make many sermons. Allow me, and I don't do this very often, but allow me to change that word new creature to the word creation for just a moment. And it says this, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new man. He's not living the old life. He's living a new, a new life. 
And so, if you and I tonight are that new creation, or yes, we could still use new creature, are you living that new life? No longer identified with the old world. We're identified with Christ. Listen to what the Lord said in John 5 and 24, and we'll close with that. John 5 and 24, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and I shall not come into condemnation, or and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I'm glad all of you are living tonight. And I'm not just speaking of an earthly life. I'm glad that you have an eternal life in front of you that no one can take away. Do you know why? Because God holds us in His hand and He doesn't drop us. If it were up to us to try to hold on to salvation, we'd end up letting go at some time or another. You see these folks to go win a vehicle and they have to place their hands on that vehicle. Not many of them hang in there for a long time. But we don't have to worry about that because God has us in His hands. And we are safe in those hands. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank You for Your Word and I thank You, Father, for salvation. Father, as we come to a close of this time, we just praise You. We love You because You loved us first. I ask, Father, that You would watch over each and every one here as they leave tonight, as they go to their homes. And as they begin a, a work week this week, Father, just put someone in our place. And I, I know that uh, with COVID going on, sometimes it's hard to speak and hard to hear with a mask. But Father, put someone in our pathway that we might speak the words of Christ. We might speak the gospel to them this week. And I pray that you would touch each and every one in Jesus' name. Amen.